And our final speaker for this morning's session is Natalia Toro, and she'll be talking about probing the dark sector. And I will interrupt orally at 25 minutes in just to let you know that you have five more minutes. Okay, thanks, Natalia. Can you share your screen? Let's see. Okay, hopefully you see a blank screen now and a title slide now. We do. Everything's okay. Good. Okay, thanks. Excellent. So thank you very much. Um, I'm really excited to be back here at Fino. Uh, it's been quite a while, actually, and obviously I wish I were there in person, um, but one year in the future. Uh, I'm going to be telling you today about opportunities to explore the idea of a dark sector, which will take us to sort of the opposite extreme of parameter space to what Joe was just talking about, thinking about relatively light dark matter at familiar mass scales and associated new forces that are hiding right under our noses, but sufficiently weak that we can't see them. So this is an area that I've been thinking about um, in a couple of different directions over the last decade. Uh, it can also be motivated in several different ways. And today I'm going to approach dark sectors starting from the idea of wimp dark matter and just tweaking and expanding it a little bit to dark matter interacting through a new force rather than weak forces and see what parameter space that opens up. Uh, so I'll talk through this motivation, the building blocks and sort of parametric expectations for new forces. And finally, the meat of the talk, how to look for this kind of light dark matter and dark sectors and really a renaissance of new experiments that has come about over the last decade. And in this experimental section, there is a huge breadth of different possibilities to cover. So I'll probably end up going a little bit fast, but I'm happy to discuss more offline or during the questions or during the uh, coffee break that follows. Okay, so, uh, so we begin with the question of dark matter. And that's obviously been seen in systems on many different length scales, many different mass scales and different cosmological eras from the CMB to galaxies and clusters. And all of these systems are telling us how much dark matter there is and they're bounding things like its interaction rate and decays, but we still don't know what it's made of or how it talks to us aside from gravitationally. A strong candidate that's emerged over the years is the idea of WIMP dark matter. And I think this has been appealing for three main reasons. One is that it has simple familiar particle content. We're just going to add a new particle that just like all the particles in the standard model, it interacts with weak force. It has an equally simple and predictive cosmology that dark matter could be produced through thermal freeze out in the early universe. So through its thermalized interactions with ordinary matter. And lastly, when you put these ingredients together and ask what mass range a WIMP should live in, you get the kind of few GeV to TeV range, which is a range where we know there's a lot of physics from electroweak symmetry breaking, and we suspect that there is even more physics at those mass scales associated with the radiative protection of electroweak symmetry breaking, in other words, addressing the hierarchy problem. Now, that said, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when people were first starting to talk about WIMPs, there are several places that we expected we might well see WIMPs that they have not actually been seen in the intervening years, even though we have looked there. So for example, in direct detection, there was a naive expectation that you should have tree level scattering through a Z for most models of WIMPs, and that's now been excluded by direct detection. Although there's certainly cases where that tree level scattering is forbidden, and so direct detection can't actually probe them. Um, production of dark matter and of related particles at colliders is another thing that's now been explored to very high energies by the LHC. Um, and most recently, the uh, heavy thermal we know has now been constrained pretty well by indirect detection in the high energy gamma rays. Um, so a lot of the simple ideas for what dark matter could be, not all of them, but many of the simple ideas for what wimp dark matter could be, have been explored. And I think I keep saying not all of them because the next steps in a wimp search are very important. Things like simple Higgsino models are still untested as well as variations thereof. And so I think this is an important program to continue. Uh, but I think it's also time in light of all of these null results to broaden the lamppost and really think about what uncharted territory we could be missing based on these assumptions and how to loosen those assumptions to start exploring them. And so the modest proposal that I'll start with is the idea that actually dark matter isn't interacting through the weak force, it's interacting through a new force. The standard model already has four types of gauge of forces, gauge forces, three, well, three gauge forces plus gravity. Um, what happens if we just say there's one more 
And to explain why this new force wouldn't have been seen already, this will be a force that ordinary matter doesn't couple to directly. And so it tends to couple very weakly to ordinary matter. But dark matter might have more significant interactions to this new force. Um, this would hardly be the first time that the resolution of some part problem involving particles or a need for new particles was coupled to new forces, most notably neutrinos and weak interactions, or nuclear structure, and the strong interactions. Um, so this is a reasonable thing to consider. And we're actually immediately rewarded in two ways. The first is very simple to understand. The dark matter can be stabilized by its charge under this new force, if it's the lightest stable particle that carries this new a new quantum number that the new force couples to. And the second is a little more subtle, and so I'll need to take a bit of a detour before I get to it, which is that actually this scenario can preserve much of the WIMP story and extend it to lower masses. In particular, well, it's already a fairly simple particle content. But what about the thermal history and what about reasonable mass ranges? So to do that, we need to start with a new force and ask, well, how would we expect it to talk to us? Um, and in general, since we're saying the dark matter is now going to be standard model neutral, it should be interacting through interactions that standard model neutral things can have with ordinary matter. These standard model neutral things might not be the dark matter themselves itself that has a dimensionless coupling. It might be some other light particle associated with it. Uh, but these interactions of neutral stuff with standard model stuff can be classified just based on symmetry if we focus on the renormalizable or super renormalizable interactions that you'd expect to dominate at low energies. Um, and so basically, any standard model neutral vector can mix with the photon. So that means any new gauge force can have some, U1 gauge force can have some mixing with the photon. And that's an allowed operator that'll be relevant at low energies um, and could lead to interactions between neutral matter, namely the dark matter, and ordinary matter. This is actually going to be the main working example that I talked about in this talk, the vector portal. But I also want to emphasize that there are several other possibilities for how this dark sector could connect to us. Um, a standard model neutral scalar from the dark sector can mix with the Higgs. And a standard model neutral fermion could mix with neutrinos. And then people also talk about adding new vectors that weakly gauge standard model fermions, which is another dimension for interaction, although it does involve changing, assigning new quantum numbers or gauging new symmetries of the standard model. Okay. So if we take this idea that there's now some new standard model neutral vector, new U1 vector, we actually could, would expect that due to radiative corrections, it may couple to the standard model. And this can happen through some very high mass or intermediate mass new particles that are charged under both forces. So even though the light matter is either standard model charged or dark sector charged, heavier dark matter, heavier particles in the theory might have both charges. And then loops of those particles would generate mixings at a level of 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 6 for this parameter epsilon. Um, but the 10 to the minus 6 range being associated with uh, grand unified theories of the standard model or grand unified theories of the dark sector, but certainly the standard model gut scenario has a lot of motivation. And that would lead to couplings that are basically generated at two loops or at one loop with threshold suppression. And so you get these 10 to the minus 6 scale mixings. And that mix, the 10 to the minus 6 scale mixing is going to correspond to the new force coupling to ordinary matter at a level of 10 to the minus 6 times the electron charge. So we have a very weak force as far as standard model particles are concerned possibly a stronger force as far as dark matter particles are concerned. Now, this also fits nicely, actually, with the idea of a low mass scale. So for decades, we've been thinking about the weak scale, because this is where part of matter with ordinary order one couplings to the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking should live, similar to the W mass. But we know that in the standard model, there's particles that get their masses from other mechanisms. The proton mass is exponentially suppressed by dimensional transmutation from some much larger mass scale. Um, the electron mass is coming from the weak scale times a small number in the electrons case that you call a coupling. And hidden sector matter can get its masses from similar mechanisms as well. Could be another dark sector dimensional transmutation, or it could be suppressed by a different small number, in this case, the transmixing scale, 
relative to the weak scale or supersymmetry breaking scale or something like that. And so it's very reasonable to think about hidden sector matter over a much broader mass range, in particular mass ranges comparable to the electron or proton masses. So if we take these weak couplings and low masses and we ask, well, what kind of interaction cross section do you need to get a thermal freeze out of dark matter? You find, depending on the exact properties of the dark matter, these three kind of lines, and this is again specific, these wiggles are specific to the vector portal. The overall scaling is pretty much portal independent. Um, but depending on the exact properties, the spin of the dark matter, whether it's annihilation is S wave or P wave, you get a sort of band, between, spanned by these lines of different interaction strengths. And that band in the MEV to GEV mass range that we thought was reasonable is very consistent with the kind of interaction strengths that you'd expect from these one to two loop kinetic mixing couplings. And so this whole story really does hold together that hidden sector dark matter interacting with us through a new force has a simple and very familiar analogous to the standard model particle content, maintains the simple predictive cosmology of thermal freeze out, although it certainly opens up other possibilities as well. And the mass range that it spans continues to be motivated and is actually much broader than WIMPs. And because the mass range is broader, the kind of coupling scales we're looking at are very different. This has opened up a lot of new opportunities for how to search for dark matter and the dark sector in which it lives. Um, and loosely speaking, we can divide these into three regions. Uh, dark matter scattering, which in the low mass region was nicely covered by Knuth's talk, um, talking about experiments like Sensei. And so I'll give just a brief theoretical perspective on that, but won't try to talk about the experiments. Uh, searches for new forces and light dark matter production. And like I said, this has really been an area that's exploded over the last decade. And so I've tried to, since I can only give a smattering, I've tried to give you some references on this slide to uh, community reports from major workshops, the dark matter, uh, small projects, new initiatives, basic research needs report from DOE, and the uh, and a recent review by uh, Gail and Franchi, Maxine Pospilov and uh, Philip Schuster whose last name got cut off there. Um, okay, so I encourage you to look at these references if you, if you want to learn, dive deeper into the subject. I'm going to try to give a brief overview of this, uh, starting again very briefly with uh, sub-GEV direct detection. Um, I have to say this has been a really amazing transformation. Obviously, if you want to look for sub-GEV dark matter, you need to look in a region, a lower mass range than people have traditionally focused for WIMPs. Uh, and I think the evolution has really been remarkable. And this is illustrated by uh, the, if you look at the sort of standard dark matter parameter space plot from Snowmass 2013, the lower cutoff of the mass range was one GEV. Um, there were the low mass WIMP searches like super CDMS. We're trying to get down to this one GEV range, maybe even a little bit lower, but this was where they cut off the plots in 2013. And then you move forward four years, Cosmic Visions 2017. Um, people were making plots with you know, 20 odd lines on them for different experimental ideas, where one GEV became the upper limit of their mass range. And the lower limit on this plot goes to one MEV and there's even ideas to go to KEV dark matter masses. And this really requires new ideas for how to search for the dark matter scattering, things like electron recoils, the amygdala effect, liquid helium detectors with very low excitations and advanced materials to get to even lower excitation energies. So this has been a remarkable growth area over the last decade, um, and it's very exciting. I think Knut talked about Sensei, and so I'm going to use a sort of Sensei, I'm going to use a sort of Sensei-like detector to talk about how this, uh, how this fits into the model parameter space. Um, and I think there's, there's very good news and some, some worse news here when we just think about these thermal dark matter milestones. Um, in cases where the dark matter scattering cross-section is just suppressed by the small coupling, that's, for example, this elastic scalar line, or another one on here is the asymmetric, an asymmetric fermion dark matter also gives you a predicted interaction cross, minimum interaction cross-section. Um, these give you cross-sections at the level of 10 to the minus 37, to 10 to the minus 41-ish centimeters squared. And 
already with a hundred gram year sensei-like experiment, this can be well covered over a large part of this new mass range. And then you can go even further in mass by using complementary techniques and by expanding to bigger detectors. Already by the time you get to something like a ton year scale, if you can imagine scaling up something and any of these low threshold detectors to a ton scale detector, you start contending with neutrino backgrounds which are affecting, which are limiting the sensitivity um, or limiting the improvement of sensitivity. And unfortunately, some of the other models that we talked about have gone way down in this parameter space to, uh, to sort of 10 to the minus 45, 10 to the minus 55 cross sections. And the reason for that is really tied to the dark matter that you're looking at, whose scattering you're looking at being non-relativistic. And so you could have velocity dependent scattering in the case of a Majorana fermion. Um, in the case of inelastic models, um, which are also very natural to consider in this case, because they're just the standard EF, the basic EFT that allows for all, you know, all, uh, all interactions and all mass terms compatible with the symmetry breaking of the, the dark the dark sector mediator having a mass tend to have these solely inelastic interactions, which means that elastic scattering enters at loop level. Um, so these can be very tricky scenarios to see. Um, the elastic scalar possibility will be explored very soon by direct detection. Many other simple models are just too low in cross-section to see them through elastic scattering. Now, I think this can be seen as a very pessimistic plot. I'm actually more optimistic for two reasons. The first is that, of course, there's lots of other models outside of this thermal class that I'm focusing on that can be discovered here too. Um, and again, a, one possibility for thermal models can also be explored in very near term by direct detection. I also think there's a lot of interesting possibilities for signals adjacent to the standard direct detection, but not exactly the standard direct detection, um, to look for some of these more channel, more challenging cases. And I don't know if any of these will be robust, but I'm, I'm certainly working on exploring several things in this direction right now. The basic lesson here is that it's hard to explore the physics of semi-relativistic annihilation of dark matter using very non-relativistic halo dark matter. And so this means accelerator-based searches, which are inherently going to be looking in the relativistic regime, are an essential tool in order to explore this idea of dark sectors as broadly as we can. And so with that, I wanna just turn a little bit to the phenomenology of the mediating particle. In this case, again, I'm gonna focus on a vector portal mediator or also known as a dark photon um, and how we might expect to see it in the lab. Um, so I'll start with the dark photon because that's one particle that we know depending on its, that couples directly to the standard model. Um, we can also talk about interactions mediated by virtual dark photons, um, but this is a good place to start. So we have in this model, two new particles, the dark photon at minimum, the dark photon and the dark matter. And depending on their mass hierarchy, you might have mediators heavy enough to decay to dark matter or you might have mediators that are lighter than twice the dark matter mass, which means that they decay visibly. And in either case, you can have annihilation through a single A prime, a single dark photon in the S channel, um, leading to the thermal freeze out of the dark matter. Um, and so the story that I just told you applies. Um, this sort of bifurcation means that we need to think about two kinds of searches. Searches for the mediator decaying visibly, and searches for the mediator decaying to dark matter or for off-shell dark, dark matter being produced from an off-shell mediator, which can happen in a couple other parts of the parameter space. When we talk about the off-shell mediator production, it'll be very similar qualitatively to the on-shell mediator production, which can happen basically anytime there are photons in enough phase space, then you will have mechanisms to produce dark photons. So this can happen through radiation of a scattered electron, through annihilation of electron positron pairs or QQ bar pairs, and through decays of mesons, for example, that would decay normally to photons. For example, a pi naught can decay to a photon and a dark photon as well. If they do decay visibly, then the dark photon's width is controlled by the same param small parameter epsilon squared that we talked about earlier. Um, that 
So the same par parameter suppresses the production cross-section as well as the decay width. And as a result of that suppression, you can get long-lived dark photons that might travel in a sort of few GeV scale um, energy, with a few GeV scale energy, they might travel tens of centimeters or even a meter before they decay. On the other hand, at larger epsilons, larger epsilons, you're also going to have very short-lived possibilities for the dark photon. And so this is going to call for a wide variety of different experiments to look for it. I'll just mention again, this range of epsilons and masses that we've talked about is sort of very consistent with the radiative picture for the dark matter uh, for the kinetic mixing origin. Um, and it's very consistent with the thermal origin for hidden sector dark matter, um, which, uh, which is shown here, although I should mention that at low masses, the parameter space, the, the, this process typically doesn't dominate. There's other processes that can take over. Um, and I've cited one reference that goes into it. Uh, so this provides a kind of lower limit on what kind of coupling you should expect to see for, uh, for dark matter, um, for these dark matter models. What, what is the particular range of interest we want to look at um, for, for, for the mixing? So one can look for this in the prompt region by just looking for very, at very high statistics at E plus E minus pair production, where the dark photon would just show up as a small peak in the E plus E minus mass distribution. And this can be done with very high statistics searches. Anything that produces a huge statistics of E plus E minus invariant mass in some spectrum, you look for peaks. And this has been done successfully at many different experiments. It's been proposed for mu, mu to 3E as well. Um, and this approach has closed the window that was open for many years for a dark photon resolving the G minus 2 anomaly. You can also start looking for the displaced vertices. And this has been proposed at electron beams by the heavy photon search experiment, which is directly trying to reconstruct a centimeter scale displaced vertex in an electron beam. Um, or you can try to, uh, to search for these long-lived parameters particles using experiments like beam dumps or using new auxiliary detectors at the LHC. And I've shown some examples here. Um, on the left is the sensitivity and a schematic of the layout for the phaser detector, which is a proposal to put a detector, a lightweight detector, hundreds of meters downstream of the interaction point at Atlas, taking advantage of forward, inter forward, um, forward particle production at Atlas to look for long-lived decays. Um, Sequest uses hundred, a fixed target experiment, but with hundreds of GeV protons hitting a target. And then you're looking for decays sort of several meters downstream of the production point. Um, now those distances are a lot larger than what I was just talking about, the tens of centimeters, but you can still see much of the same physics because the boosts are also much higher at these experiments. Um, and these are also very high luminosity searches and have nice sensitivity to particles that mix with the Higgs in addition to dark photon models. Um, so I think these sort of highly boosted, very forward configurations uh, with proton beams are a really exciting new direction in, uh, in looking for dark sectors over the last several years. Um, and uh, sorry, I combined two older slides, so we'll skip that one. Um, so, so in short, there's a lot of different programs that we need simultaneously in order to look for uh, for dark sector mediator decays to ordinary matter, the so-called visible decay program. Um, and uh, and you can you can really sorry, I'm trying to trying to get back to uh, to this. Um, hopefully you can see on these plots there's really overlapping contours for com complementary techniques that are going a long way towards probing this full parameter space, um, but you really need a multi-experiment program to do so. Okay, so I wanna turn now to dark matter production and accelerators. Um, and this can be produced from mediator decays with the mediators produced through any of the processes that we just talked about, or from an off-shell mediator that might just give you 
particle decays directly to dark matter particle antiparticle pairs. Um, the challenge of this search is probably pretty obvious that if dark matter is interacting very weakly and it's comparable in mass to light standard model particles, it's not taking away a lot of mass. It's not going to be produced, it's not disproportionately energetic, so you're not going to see any shoulders and distributions. Um, how do we know when we've actually produced it? There's really two different conceptual ways that we can look for dark matter. The first is by looking for, by making secondary beams of dark matter from a really intense beam of protons or electrons interacting on a target. So we let protons, say, interact in a thick beam dump. They'll produce lots of pions. Those pion decays inevitably produce some amount of dark matter, and that dark matter tends to be boosted forwards and highly relativistic. And one can then look for its scattering in a downstream detector. And this is a sort of conceptually similar to direct detection, but at very different kinematics. And in fact, if you should think of this search as a lot more like a uh, accelerator-based neutrino experiment, where you would have a neutrino, secondary neutrino beam going forward, and you look for the scattering of neutrinos downstream. In a time of uh, five minutes, approximately. Thank you. Um, so this has been done. It all sets some of the most powerful constraints we have to date on, uh, on light dark matter uh, in this mass range. And I've shown here two old experiments from the 1980s, E137, an electron dump at SLAC, and the well-known LSND experiment at Los Alamos as well as a modern mini boon dark matter experiment. I believe this is a 2018 analysis of their data. Um, and so these are, these are, as I said, some of the leading constraints on uh, light dark matter. The other leading constraints that you see in gray here, I'll talk about in just a moment, um, starting to probe regions associated with these, uh, these thermal milestones that I highlighted earlier. And even though this is dark matter scattering, because the scattering is relativistic, we don't see a big separation between these different possibilities for what the dark matter could be. So a couple of things I want to say about this plot. Um, it's important to remember, I've shown this in the parameter space that's most natural for the freeze out targets. Um, it's not directly what we're exploring in these accelerator-based searches, which have different dependence on the mass ratio between the dark matter and the, and the mediator, and on the dark sector self-coupling than the freeze-out curves do. So what's generally done is to take a sort of worst case scenario for how these parameters, what these parameters could be at a fixed value of this Y, com this combination of parameters that controls the free zone. And in particular, the worst case happens when you're strongly coupled. Alpha dark of 0.5 is around the perturbativity limit, so that's why it's a common benchmark. And when the masses of the dark matter and mediator are close together. Um, and so three is taken as a sort of close to resonance, but not on resonance, kind of near, near worst case model. Um, but it's not. Completely worst case, if you took slices at different alpha darks or different mass ratios, most slices you could take off resonance would have somewhat higher lines. And slices that you take near resonance would bring these lines further down relative to the, relative to the dark matter sensitivity. Um, so the point is these experiments are already probing thermal dark matter scenarios, but they're not probing all of the parameter space. And this, this plot is a way to show where do we need to get to really fully probe this parameter space. Now, there's ideas for how to improve on these, um, on these searches with uh, short baseline experiments, um, coherent scattering experiments, electron beam dump experiments. And all of these go up to 10 to the 22, 10 to the 23 particles on target, really high luminosities. The challenge is that the yield scales for these experiments, like a small interaction squared. You pay a penalty for production of dark matter, and then you pay another penalty for the scattering of dark matter. And so it's very hard to scale them up enough to go you know, two, three orders of magnitude in coupling like you'd want to, to explore this whole parameter range. So to beat that scaling, you really need to take a different approach. Um, and this is the other kind of class of experiments on the scene is experiments that try to detect an order one fraction of the dark matter production reactions by looking at the kinematics of the physical final states. 
Uh, so this can be done in E plus E minus annihilation. It was done at the bar. And uh, in the near term, will be done by Bell 2 with a small luminosity. You'll see that'll already improve significantly on the bar. Um, and then also in fixed target environments by NA64, a missing energy experiment. So these here I've just shown the sort of near term progress. And you see that with just 10 to the 12 electrons on target for this NA64 experiment, these are already competitive and poised in the next year or two to really take over the, sensitive, the, the scene in terms of sensitivity to light dark matter. Um, in the next sort of five to 10 years, the expectations are even more exciting for this kind of experiment. So depending on the backgrounds that are seen, NA64 and Bell 2 will be able to go another one to two orders of magnitude lower in coupling space. And then there's another proposal, LDMX, that I'm involved in that wants to do a missing momentum experiment. It's closely related to the NA64 search um, with 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 16 electrons on target. Uh, and what I think this plot conveys is that whereas the kinds of improvements you can get from a beam dump experiment are you know, noticeable but incremental, um, Changing over to a missing energy, missing momentum style of experiment or missing mass in the case of the B factories is really a game changer with, really, with relatively accessible luminosities. So I wanna talk a little bit in the last minute I have here about how LDMX works uh, to leave some time for questions. Um, so essentially we're looking at reactions. I've shown the on-shell mediator case here where dark matter is produced as an electron recoils off a nucleus in the target of the experiment. And that reaction typically leads to the electron recoiling with a very small fraction of the en energy it started with. Most of the energy goes to the dark matter and that's simply a result of kinematics, the fact that the dark matter is heavier than the electron um, in this sort of leading, leading production channel. Um, kinematics leads to it carrying most of the energy. That's very different from the Bremsstrahlung distribution. Of course, it's also a much lower rate for dark matter production. So the first thing this experiment does is to measure that recoiling electron in a tracker. The tracker will be very similar to the HPS tracker. Um, that still leaves this sort of 3% chunk of ordinary scattering reactions that will also leave the same kind of signal in a tracker. So that's not by itself enough to see dark matter. The second piece that's really important is measuring the total energy of visible products that are coming out of this reaction. If you've produced dark matter, that total energy should be just the electron. If you've produced dark matter and a photon, it will be the electron plus the energy carried in the photon. And that should add up roughly to the total beam energy. So this is a calorimetric measurement and that's actually the trigger for an LDMX uh, measurement. So that reduces the background enormously, but it's actually still not enough. Uh, we're still getting hundreds of Hertz of standard model events that have low energy deposition. And so the final piece is uh, now we need to find the find evidence for the rare reactions that would have led to that low energy deposition. And those are predominantly interactions where a photon hits the calorimeter, but instead of starting a normal electromagnetic shower, it produces a handful of muons or pions or energetic protons or neutrons. Uh, those can be detected in the case of neutrons with a hadronic calorimeter downstream, and in the case of all the other particles by the kinds of features that they leave in the eCal, things like tracks or really different shapes of showers owing to multiple hadrons being produced. Um, so that's the third ingredient is a powerful veto. And then the last ingredient in LDMX is using the, uh, the tracker to measure the transverse momentum of a recoiling electron. And this transverse momentum distribution is quite different for dark matter signals compared to the background because that background is dominated by just Bremsstrahlung. It has a very forward peaked kinematics. Dark matter production, even though this is light dark matter, tens of MeV, that's still going to be a noticeably different transverse momentum distribution. And so this can be used as a last handle to get confidence in whether a signal is background or that was just failed to fail, got through our veto somehow or really production of new physics with a different mass scale, and actually gives you a an estimator for the mass scale of the dark matter physics that's being produced as well. Um, so I'll close just by saying that I think the, the biggest excitement here is the fact that we can, if, if these models are, are realized, um, 
explore them in a bunch of different ways and use the complementary measurement handles we have from each of these experiments to, uh, to measure the properties of the dark matter. It will really enter a dark, dark sector standard model discovery program. Um, so I'll just conclude here. No need to read this. Um, and sorry for going long. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Natalia. Let's all thank Natalia. That was a great talk. Um, so we may have maybe a minute or so for questions, um, but I don't see any. Okay. So I know that Brian has raised his hand. Uh, so if there are no questions, let's thank Natalia again. That was a really clear talk. And